Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar, What Comes Next? How to Adapt Your Skill Set for the New Era of Market Research. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer for real-time market research platform, Suzy. We partner with hundreds of the world's top brands in helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for both quantitative and qualitative insights to drive business decisions. And joining me on today's discussion is Suzy's Director of Market Research, Mary Emerson Baker, and our SVP of Audience Development, Brian Silverman. Welcome, Mary and Brian. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Awesome. So we're going to do a little bit of get to know you session first. And for anyone in the audience who does not know me or my background, I actually joined Susie just over a year ago now. Um, but I did start my career always in market research at a food and beverage company in the UK to begin with. Um, however, I spent the majority of my career in either syndicated market research firms or the online sample side of our industry at fast growing SaaS platforms. And it's been an exciting ride watching the industry change and grow over those last 20 years. Um, but my background is actually fairly different from my two esteemed colleagues who are with me. So Mary, you and I obviously know each other quite well, but could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Absolutely. Um, I have also had the pleasure of watching the industry change over the last 20 plus years. Um, I started on the corporate side um, in insurance and consumer electronics. Um, I it was involved with new product development from beginning to end. Uh, did a lot of shopper before we called it shopper. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, I was a uh, moved to the supplier side. I was a consultant for a bit. Um, I worked in packaging with uh, what used to be Perception Research Services. And most recently, Kantar. Um, I came to Suzy just about three months ago. Um, and I um, I love it. And I feel like, you know, while changes happened across, you know, uh, 20 years, 20 plus years, changes have happened in the last three months as well. So it just uh, it keeps accelerating. <laughs> so we'll get into a little bit of that later. But, yeah. Um, Brian, how are yeah. Hey, everyone. I am Brian Silverman. I oversee our audience development team here at Suzy. Uh, I'm actually one of the longer tenured Suzy employees, uh, started on our enterprise sales team, spent about four or five years there, and I took over our audience development team back in January of 2020. Uh, my background has B2B sales, B2C marketing, uh, and previously I actually started my own company um, for my experience here where we printed ads on toilet paper. We gave that away for free to stadiums, restaurants, bars, you name it. And uh, while that was not quite as successful as Suzy. It was definitely a great launching ground for learning how to build a business from the ground up. Uh, my job here specifically is to drive audience growth and create a really excellent member experience to increase the overall size, quality, and diversity for the available respondents uh, for Suzy's clients. And so, as you can tell, um, I'm not coming from the market research industry. And I think it's combinations, like Katie mentioned, of, of minds like we have here today that have really helped drive Suzy forward and disrupt the industry in the way that we've been able to. Yeah. I love the fact that we have Mary with a very traditional market research background. I've always been on the tech side of market research and Brian, you've come from really outside the industry, which I think is phenomenal. So tell the audience a little bit about kind of how did you arrive at Suzy in your career and how did you get to where you are today? And Brian, we'll start with you as the most tenured person on the call. <laughs> yeah, so when I first joined, uh, the reason I, I came about six plus years ago was to really see a tech company scale. Uh, we had this amazing audience that we currently have, but instead of them answering market research questions, they were actually creating and sharing content on behalf of brands. And that's when I joined our sales team and, and saw us when we were just about 30 to 40 people. Um, about three and a half years ago, we actually pivoted from leveraging this community, kind of being micro influencers to starting to share their opinions with brands for market research. Um, and so late 2017, early 2018, that's when we launched the Suzy brand. And um, at the time, things were quite different. Um, and it's been really, really cool to see how we've been able to partner with some of the most amazing people and brands in the world. And in particular, over the last 18 months, it's been this incredible roller coaster, um, seeing our headcount actually triple um, in that time frame, which has been really exciting. Yeah. So one of those people that fell into market research accidentally almost, but you definitely Absolutely. chose to, you know, to, to, to work at a company like ours. It just so happened that we were pivoting into market research at the time. Yep. And Mary, give us your background as to, you know, coming from that traditional market research background, how did you, how did you find your, your way to Susie? And what really was the kind of inspiration to join a, a company like ours? 
Absolutely. Uh, so my background, as I mentioned, was mostly uh, corporate and consultancy based. Um, I did have an experience many years ago um, that was with a startup. And I will tell you, it, it it's one of my most exciting and memorable um, career times. Um, so when a close colleague of mine uh, mentioned Susie and had moved to Susie and wanted me to consider coming on board, um, you know, I did some investigation. I was impressed with the track record and actually also the trajectory uh, plan going forward. Um, and then the philosophy of an enabling human understanding really um, adds flexibility and uh, potential growth to um, research and discovery, right? So um, add to that the panel and the platform and the forward thinking process. Um, I think everything pulls together as a win-win. Um, but aside from that, um, after having interviewed with several people, the employees really won me over as well. It's a wonderful group um, of great thinkers and great personalities. And so it's been, it's been a lot of fun in the last three plus months. <laughs> so that's awesome. I couldn't agree more. And, and Katie, we actually met back in 2018, way before you joined, um, when you were actually trying to sell to us. <laughs> How did yep. you end up here at Susie? Yeah, we met. I remember it. It was a uh, Halloween, October 2018. Everybody was dressed up in the office, um, and it was just a couple of months after that initial pivot um, into to Susie becoming a, a market research platform. And I remember coming to your offices and, and thinking to myself, "Ah, eh, another new startup, another platform, sure, sure, no problem." Um, but then I met the team. Um, I saw the product, and I knew it was going to be a great success in the future. I knew it was going to be very different. Um, so I always kind of kept an eye on Susie. And uh, fast forward to the pandemic, um, and at the time I was in a pretty unique position. I was at a sample supplier, so I had kind of oversight into where the supply chain um, needed respondents the most. Um, and I inst almost instantly saw the kind of fast drop of sample needs coming from those larger traditional market research agencies who typically in the past had booked projects kind of weeks in advance. Um, those guys were no longer booking projects. But at the same time, I saw the meteoric rise of suddenly the sample needs coming in from those tech enabled platforms and the DIY platforms in the industry. And I kind of thought to myself, wow, the, this is a we're on the crux of a huge kind of push towards digital transformation and, and platform adoption. And so when Matt Britton um, called me in May and asked if I joined Susie, I knew it was the right company. But more importantly, I knew it was the right time as well. And uh, it's been an amazing year. So it's been really fun. <laughs> um, but Brian, tell us, take us back even further. So you were part of that pivot from CrowdTat to Susie, and you were at the launch at South by Southwest in 2018. Tell Mary and I, like, what it was, what was it like three years ago when that pivot first happened, and yeah. why market, why market research? Yeah, we were we were getting into a place that I think you know we recognized the need not as market researchers ourselves, but as the end users of research. Right? We were marketers, we were product owners, etc., and um, Oftentimes we thought to ourselves, I have a question. I want to know which package we should use or what creative message we should use. And, you know, we said, well, why don't we just ask it? Like, let's try with this audience that we have. Like, let's ask a question and get some answers. And so with that, that's kind of where we started, to be honest. And radical simplification is really something that's at the heart of everything that we built. And in the beginning, that's what it was. You could ask one question. It was a multiple choice question or an open-ended question. And that was it. And so when we launched at South by Southwest in March of 2018, we had this awesome setup at a, a donut shop actually down in Austin. Um, and we were doing demos of the platform for the first time, literally launching open-ended questions. And people were blown away. Think about that. We were literally launching one open-ended question and answers were coming in in real time and they were blown away. And they couldn't believe that these were real people giving high quality answers to their most burning business questions. Um, and, and they were amazed to see how easy and simple it was. I think on top of that, one of the things that's kind of at the heart of everything that we do is, is that we operate a little differently than a lot of the other players in the market research space, right? Um, it's Shaggy at our launch party. We have Kevin Durant as an investor. Um, and we really focus on being tech forward. Uh, we have this amazing product and engineering team who build these products at really breakneck speed. And so to think back where just three years ago it was, ask a question, get an answer. While at the core, I think a lot of what we do is is still, how do we make this thing super simple? Um, I think, frankly, thanks to people like you joining at Suzy, um, we have really gone from this quick and dirty tool, ask a question, get an answer, to this agile, robust insights tool. 
Um, and so that's what I've seen over the last three plus years. But Mary, I'm curious, this concept of being tech forward and, and radical simplification um, in the user experience, how does that translate into creating something that's really robust uh, and, and, and advanced? Well, it's interesting. You know, one thing that we are um, always cognizant of is our, you know, the, the time constraints of our clients, right? So um, we also at all times want to keep in mind that, you know, ease of use is is very important to maintain that for them or help help partner with them in that. So I really see that the, uh, the state of the art technology and innovations really meet market research in a user friendly way on Suzy on a regular basis. However, at the same time, what a lot of our clients can't see is in the background, we are developing much more in-depth uh, ways of analyzing and more complex uh, analyses, but at the same time, to keep their ease of use and user interface in mind and keeping that simple from their perspective, um, but not by no means simple um, in the background. So I think that's a you know again a, it's a win win for for them um, to be able to have that um, you know agility and and the depth of analyses, but also the user friendly aspect up front. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, and Brian, you mentioned uh, Shaggy and Kevin Durant. It's, you know, as I was looking at, at my career and making a, a tough decision last year as to should I shift to a new company, I knew that Susie was going to be different. And I have always worked at traditional market research firms um, and just to kind of see launching at South by Southwest, having Shaggy, having Kevin Durant as an investor. And I think for anybody out there who's looking at their career, you know, it's, it's about the the product and what the what the company is selling, but also what is the what is the kind of the ethos and, and culture of the company, and it's it's you know it's really different, it's really fun as well, uh, making market research fun again. Um, obviously, a lot has changed for all of us in our careers, and we've all had to adapt a lot in the past eighteen months in particular, where we've seen about five years worth of innovation in SaaS <laughs> platforms, research methodology met methodologies, as well as the way that we just run our day to day um, lives. We were. We'll share with the audience. We were all just joking that we're pretty much all wearing flip flops whilst on this <laughs> call. So we may look professional at the top, but we uh, have adapted ourselves. Um, let's talk about the last 18 months and really let's talk about what's changed in the market search landscape since those early days of the of the pandemic, when the pandemic really became kind of real. Brian, you were the, the only one of the three of us that were at, was at Susie. So what really happened in those early days of the pandemic? Yeah, um, I think that what was happening at Suzy was was kind of happening in the whole world, which is like, nobody really knew what was going on. And so in March and April, we didn't know what to think. And we weren't really sure what the role of research was going to be. Um, but we quickly realized that research was going to be at the center of everything. I mean, we had clients coming to us saying they did research the previous December and January, three months ago, that just wasn't relevant anymore. I can remember articles about toilet paper flying off the shelves and hand sanitizer being sold on secondary markets and being told to wash our groceries when they were delivered and people didn't know what was going on. Uh, and so we had this great DIY tool that clients could use, but I don't really think that, you know, we thought that was cutting it, right? We researchers and marketers had this moment where they were like, wow, like everyone is relying on me now to answer questions faster than ever before. So what should I do? And so we thought more about how we could partner with our clients. And we kind of had this all hands on deck approach, um, not just in saying, buy a license to Susie and you should use it and it'll help provide fast answers, um, but rather how could we provide value to them regardless of their usage of Susie? How could we elevate research as a whole? And one of the things that we did uh, was that we launched this really amazing state of the consumer series that has dozens and dozens of webinar editions across different industries, insights from reports that we saw. Um, and of course, we did use Suzy to get up to the moment kind of real time data. I think the other thing um, that we wanted to do was fill gaps that clients were feeling. And a lot of them were coming to us saying, I can't do qual in person anymore. Like, can you please help us out with that? And we heard that quite a bit over the first few weeks. And so ultimately, that's how our Suzy Live solution was born. Um, we saw that inside in April. And by September, we had it up and running. And now we've been able to successfully run hundreds and hundreds of IDIs for our clients. Um, and so ultimately, the researcher really took a step up um, and was now more important than ever to provide real-time insights in a way that went from 
being a nice to have or something that was like, oh, how do you get this faster, better, cheaper to something that was necessary for decision making because things were changing so quickly. So from the Suzy perspective, it was really exciting to see both how our products and our platform, but also how we could partner with our clients to kind of elevate everybody. Um, but Mary, I'm, I'm curious, you weren't here at Suzy at the time, right? You've been here for about three months. Um, now that you've been here for a little while, curious to get your thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, just thinking, uh, thanks, Brian. I was just thinking about the eight, last 18 months as well. Um, for, I remember distinctly for the first, you know, couple months, silence, right? So crickets. Um, I think people uh, were kind of, you know, going inward from both a personal and professional standpoint. Um, but what became, as you saw, quickly evident is that uh, some of those people were really changing and growing while others were kind of getting stuck, right? Um, an example of that is I saw several, um, you know, qualitative uh, facilities pivot and become quantitative online recruiters, which, you know, was a great use case for them. Um, but then I watched others close their doors as well. So, you know, you, you really got to a place where you really had to decide how you were going to adapt, what you were going to do, or unfortunately, find something else, right? Um, I, I was lucky enough to work on a team that um, adapted, created, um, you know, worked with clients. Um, it was a very big learning experience for all of us, but it was a very exciting time too, because we came out, you know, uh, I think with some pretty good solutions. Um, and here at Suzy, I, I have found that eagerness to be part of the DNA, right? So, um, and while we um, do that development and foundational changing, we're always keeping the user experience in mind. So again, it's ba it's back to that balance, but it's it's uh, there's so many positive changes happening 24 seven for our clients in the background all the time. So we're adapting and we're learning and we're adapting and we're, um, you know, moving forward all the time. So I love it. And uh, that's how I have come to know Susie in this you know, crazy time. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the same for a lot of our clients as well. I saw, as you mentioned, you know, some clients kind of clammed up a little bit and, and weren't sure what to do. So took a pause and others really embraced it and embraced that change immediately for their careers. Um, I remember being at a fast growing SaaS platform during the last recession in 2008. And honestly, I think careers are made or broken during these turbulent times. There's this great quote that I once read that is, um, it's recessionary times are tumultuous times and changes are abound and brands will disappear and consumers will awaken to new patterns of thinking and buying. And as a result, the market aware research driven companies and people are best positioned to take advantage of that chaos and that change. And I think for everybody listening to this call, you know, for us as employees who want to have a strong career in that type of chaos, there is such great opportunity. And I think most career, you know, most major career accelerations really happen when someone steps into that mess and really makes a difference. Um, and I love hearing from our clients who have done exactly that over the last year. They're like, I am not just going to sit here and let this pandemic kind of run riot um, on our business, but we're really going to understand it. We're going to move forward. We are going to to make a difference. And uh, I think those companies and, and that are looking out for that type of person with that very adaptable personality are going to be the ones that are going to be successful going forward. Um, and with that said as well, we hear from a lot of our clients that the insights function within companies is very much becoming elevated. They're being, they're being very exposed over the last year. Um, what have you seen from the industry and, and what are some of the ways that you've seen brands shift their approaches to research as that becomes more highlighted? Um, Mary, you've obviously worked very closely with a lot of, um, a lot of folks over the past year or so. I have. And, you know, just to reiterate, I think marketers, um, smart marketers have embraced all of these changes. Um, you know, they understand that customers and consumers are more diverse um, in behaviors, uh, preferences and opinions. I think we've all seen very opinionated, uh, you know, dichotomies in, in our lives uh, for the last year. Um, but that has pushed marketers to try to learn more and more about how to meet consumers where they are. Um, you know, coupled with the growth in e-commerce, um, behaviors have become more and more fluid. Um, I think what this translates to is you have to talk to more than just your existing 
uh, consumers. You need to go more broad. Um, I think uh, marketers are realizing that. So uh, looking at opportunity groups, knowing that these behaviors are going to shift, not if, but when, right? So understanding that helps them um, you know, stay close to the pulse of the consumer. Um, that said, another ingredient that I have seen a major shift in, and, you know, and my gosh, I think I've been talking about this for five years, but it accelerates is the is the the impact on time, right? So business decisions, you know, three, four years ago, you couldn't think that they, you know, could get any faster, right? So, but they have, you know, um, and if they could have happened yesterday, I think everyone would be happy, right? So, um, with the impact on time being, you know, fast, um, the clients are seeking real time information um, to help these business decisions. Um, so, I think that uh, the, you know, the stage is set to use more and more online solutions for these, you know, very quick turn business decisions. Um, and I think we feed those very well. Yeah. One of our colleagues, Lima, has a great quote that the one thing that is constant is change. And so I think the people that can adapt much quicker are definitely going to get there. When I worked in a food and beverage company in the UK, we had what we called like an 18 month turnaround time. So from concept idea to getting it onto shelf was 18 months. That was our critical path. And we just last week saw a couple of products launched by one of our largest clients. And I had to think to myself, didn't we only just sign that kind of contract that project in January I looked back and yeah that concept idea was only just started to be tested in January and now it's on the shelf already and that's it's phenomenal to see that um and Brian of course your specialty kind of lies on the audience side so what are you seeing in terms of how our consumers are interacting with surveys and how the other side of the market changes because we can talk about you know clients and uh, and so on all day but what about those consumers who are actually yeah. taking part yeah, I'm glad that you you asked this because it's a uh, it's important to consider kind of the other side of what's going on here, which is sort of the lifeblood of what we're doing here, which are consumers, right? They're respondents, and so Katie, you and I actually attended a conference called SampleCon uh, a few weeks ago, uh, working with many of the suppliers in the industry, right? The the folks that all these respondents come from, and a lot of them were very open, uh, and they were kind of talking about how there's a supply constraint, there's so much demand, so many questions being asked. I mean, we we're talking here about how there's so much research being done, um, and how there's just been this interesting intersection also of, of poor quality kind of being rampant in the industry. And so this balance of a supply constraint and quality issues hasn't been great. Um, and so, you know, we've been lucky here, I think at Suzy to have invested ahead of the curve and we're shielded a bit from this because we have our own audience here, um, which means that we're able to get some of that feasibility and we're able to keep high quality. Um, but I think going back to kind of what you both were mentioning here that I wanna kind of close the loop on is is these quicker innovation cycles. Um, and we often think of this as a platform or agency perspective and how we can provide this to the brand, but it's actually a really awesome experience for our members. They love seeing their opinions in real life and, and being, seeing that turned around in ads or products that are created. Um, you mentioned food and beverage, uh, that there are things on the shelf so fast. Um, you look at brands like Lysol and Clorox and the way that they've adapted um, and partnered with hotels and airlines. Uh, and ultimately, the way I look at this uh, from an audience perspective is that this helps drive engagement. Members look to do this, not just to make a quick buck, but also to give their opinion to the biggest brands in the world and have it really matter. Uh, there's one quote that I constantly think about that really rings true here, which is uh, a member who said to us, the coolest moment for me about using the platform was seeing a product on the shelves of Walmart that a couple months prior I had helped provide my opinion on. And I think that you know speaks volumes of what the incentives are here uh, and, and what really drives really high engagement. And over the last 18 months, um, you know, seeing how consumers want to be a part of these quick innovation cycles is, is really exciting and really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a, such a big theme at SampleCon. I mean, it always has been the the respondent experience. Um, but to your point, I think it goes way beyond just the UX or not having too many grid questions or length of interview, which are always kind of the things we blame the, the fastest. <laughs> um, but I think it is that experience of did there was their voice heard? Was it valued? And did that product come to market? Or did the ad start you know uh going online and i think that's such a good point that that respondent experience is about their voice made a difference not just the actual in survey experience um have the brands themselves kind of changed their audience approach over the last year and a half 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think as, as Mary mentioned, I think the biggest difference that I've noticed is yes, brands want to keep in touch with their customers and see what's going on to make sure that they're providing what they need. But ultimately, I've noticed that way more brands are actually looking for prospects and general category users, not just their brand user. And I think what we're noticing is that this is a really rare opportunity um, because customers aren't sure what they want to do. They're not sure what to think and they're willing to try new things. And it is an opportunity to bring new customers and new consumers to your brand. So we found it essential to talk to the whole addressable market, to talk to all category users, not necessarily just your own brand consumer or your CRM database. And I think it's the combination of being able to, yes, do your customer research, but being able to talk to this larger universe of consumers uh, that our clients have been really interested in when it comes to the audiences that they're looking to talk to. Yeah, I think it was one of our clients actually on a webinar a couple of months ago who said this is kind of a unique time in history. It's a once in a you know, career opportunity to really obtain new users, new brand loyalists, um, and get that household penetration that was difficult to crack into. And so now's the time to really embrace just the full category of users, not just current brand users, for sure. Um, so um, when it comes to um, really thinking about the the our actual users now and our clients um, and obviously with the you know as well as shortages in sample supply there's also shortages often in hiring which I'm sure you know everybody in the industry has seen and we can't seem to hire quick enough but for our clients it's also impacting them they're working either solo or they're very small teams um, but their role has become much more important so the big buzzword of course in market research these days is agility um, and we've had panelists join us in past webinars that um, you know share that sometimes they're the only market researcher in their company or the only person in the shopper analysis team. Um, and I would love to kind of know, you know, Mary, you've been in market research for a long time. How have you seen those types of shifts in kind of like team sizes and tool sizes and, and uh, resources that are given to, to companies that are conducting this type of research? Well, thank you. So um, I do believe that clients are, are you know, charged with doing more and more with less and less, right? So I think that's happening across the board. Um, I think agility, though, applies uh, to a couple things. Uh, one is, you know, with the tools, right? So I think, um, you know, it's it's a it's a very common um, application of the word agility when we're talking about um, tech and DIY and uh, those online solutions. And you know that Susie provides you know full range of services, right? But we meet that agility need, you know, from a technological standpoint. Um, but on the flip side of that, I believe that the other, you know, definition of agility can also would apply to um, resources, right? So uh, as far as professional resources and different parts of a, a research project, right? So we can provide strategic help, um, questionnaire design, storytelling, analysis, presentation. So you can kind of pick and choose, right? Um, and we offer some of those, uh, a lot of those, you know, agile solutions that are a little bit more menu approach, but they fill in um, and help our clients, you know, really have a larger team without a larger team, right? So we become part of their team. Yeah, absolutely. And it does feel like just yesterday that, you know, we were quoting kind of six week timelines um, on projects in these days, you know, consumer sentiments shift far too quickly. You know, if you ask somebody their opinion six weeks ago, um, when, when Delta was still new, it's probably very different to the answer they would give today. Um, so Mary, how can market research professionals really keep up to, up to speed with this ever changing consumer, literally ever changing consumer right now? Well, I, you know, as I mentioned, I think it's important to cast a wide net when you're trying to obtain insights and identify and understand your market. But I also think that there's value in, um, you know, once you have that, you really have to go on after your largest opportunity and try to focus on that, right? And then just prepare to be prepared to do the cycle all over again and pivot as necessary. Um, and unfortunately, really repeating, you know, wash, rinse, and repeat you know, quickly and frequently. Um, but I think it's doable as long as they can focus on, again, the major nuggets and uh, and be ready to, to pivot from there. Great. And I think when we think of faster research, we usually just think of it through the kind of quantitative lens. But of course, it's critical to conduct qualitative research too. And Mary, you're a big proponent of mixed mode kind of quant qual hybrid approaches. Could you share some pitfalls of companies who've really only conducted quant um, research in the past? 
Well, just in general, right, quant, um, and I've done both. I mean, I came from a quantitative background. I went to uh, qualitative. I was a moderator. Um, over the years, I have come to uh, completely get behind the value in actually having qualitative and quantitative um, blend and, and for those hybrid approaches. Um, and, you know, one of the main reasons is when you have a quantitative output and it's solely quantitative, you can try to get some open ends and verbatims in there, you know, but from a quantitative panel, hard to do, hard to get those quality responses um, and, and thus understanding the whys behind the quantitative results is sometimes difficult and honestly can be deceiving, right? On the flip side of that, qualitative only, wonderful texture, wonderful depth, but you don't know that 15 people represent you know, the population. So it just makes so much sense to have the two work together. Um, and then there are a couple ways that they can do that. One, qualitative can be used upfront to really try to inform the quantitative questionnaire. Um, make sure you're asking the right questions with the, you know, the correct answers, choices. Um, but then on the other side, as I mentioned, it's a great thing to follow up to quantitative research as well to understand and get underneath um, the whys. Uh, behind that research. Um, and I know, Katie, that you have a great example um, of one without the other. And although I have several, I think this one takes the cake. So I'm going to hand it. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a really good example. And I think, you know, in, in, in today's world, people think qual, I think open ends, I think qual, I think kind of chat um, and, and bulletin boards and so on. But I think that face to face, um, you know, if it can't be in person, but video qual, is so, so important. And the story I have that it's probably 15 years old now, but I worked at an Italian food and beverage company and we produced this beautiful creme caramel pot. The pot looked very um, uh, high, high end. It was kind of had like lots of different ridges in it. And the premise was that you take the creme caramel and you empty it out onto um, the plate and it has this like beautiful pattern to it essentially, but it wasn't selling. And we, um, I was doing all the surveys I could on, you know, do you like creme caramel? To what extent would you purchase creme caramel? To what extent would you purchase in that particular retailer that we were in? What was the price point? I couldn't find anything. I'm like, the price is great. Consumers want to buy it. The propensity to purchase is high. The retailer is the right retailer. I cannot seem to get under this problem. Um, so I conducted two face-to-face -face focus groups um, and gave out the creme caramel pots and again, asked all those questions at the beginning, tell me about your propensity to purchase, do you like the flavor and so on. The minute it got to the point where they had to open the pot, they all, I had, they had plates in front of them, but they all opened the pot and just got the spoon straight into the pot. And then almost every single person said, I can't get my spoon into all the different gaps. So it's really low um, value for money because I actually can't even get half the product. It's just wasted. I feel like I'm wasting my money on getting this type of pot. I'm like, that aha moment was, I'm like, how did I miss this? Um, and it was because I was only doing quantitative research. And so it really took that face to face. And uh, which is why, you know, I'm so glad that Sudi Live is literally live. We can ask consumers to go to their fridge, to pull out those things, bring the product to to the video so we can really get underneath it and see it. Um, and Brian, obviously Qual is, is brand new to you just last year. So what have, what have your thoughts been on the role of Qual at scale and Qual at speed? Yeah, um, I think really for me, Qual at scale and speed has opened up whole new opportunities for leveraging Qual and research, right? Um, the more insights that we can have like you had the faster we can have these feedback loops and the faster we can help create better innovations and so i think qual is so important to kick off a research process as you look into white space as mary mentioned it can add some color and richness to quant results and more and in the past you had to spend weeks or months and hundreds of thousands of dollars to get qual done and at some point it often wasn't worth it um, but now you're able to pair these things together and complete a survey and some IDIs in just a matter of days. And so it really does add that depth and richness to research that we see our clients doing. Um, I'll also say that as the audience lead, I wouldn't do justice in this conversation if I didn't comment about the fact that our members love doing this. They love seeing their insights mm -hmm. come to life. They love having these one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's, it's really fun. Uh, and it's a, it's a really nice way to compliment the work that they are doing in giving their opinions in addition to you know some more traditional quant and surveys. So it's not to say that digital qual is the only way to go. Um, but I, I do think that the nature of in-person qual will need to change to kind of adapt to these needs of scale and speed. Yeah. Yeah. And Mary, of course, in your past, you mentioned you conducted a lot of face-to-face -face, um, qual. Do you think that 
post pandemic that the new digital call habits will remain or do you think that there is a role for face to face call um, to come back and, and to be part of our future? Um, good question. I, I think I have seen the, you know, quality of online call just, you know, grow in leaps and bounds over the last, especially over the last year, year and a half. Um, but I think there'll always be a place for in-person call um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, there are certain tests that really are better in person, you know, uh, hands on product tests, food development testing, just to name a couple, right? Taste tests, things like that. Um, but one of the other valuable parts of in person that I have learned over and over again is the whole workshop environment with all of those decision makers being in the same place at the same time. Um, they are having conversations that it would take weeks and months sometimes to have outside of that, you know, room. Um, and they're iterating and they're designing and they're, I mean, I've seen, you know, new products come out of a backroom discussion, you know, on a piece of paper and, you know, then they're off to the races, right? So it's very exciting to have everyone together. And for those reasons, I think there will be always be a place uh, for in-person qualitative research. Yeah, you raised such a good point um, that a lot of us, I know, we all we all miss a whiteboard. So when we're chatting on calls, we're and trying, trying to plan our future and resources and, and planning. It's kind of like, where's my white? I need a whiteboard, <laughs> a yellow <laughs> post-it note for sure. And Brian, of course, you know, SampleCon being face to face this year was phenomenal. It's kind of, I'd I'd forgotten what it was like to have a detailed conversation on stage and then to be able to just have lunch and just like really chat it through and yeah, make notes and come up with great ideas face-to-face. -face. I'm looking forward to, fingers crossed, a lot more of the industry events um, in the next, well, the back half of this year should, fingers crossed, be face-to-face -face as well. Okay. Um, so shifting into kind of hiring and skills and, and really what's next, in, in what way should market, prof, uh, market research professionals be potentially kind of modifying their skills and adapting to these industry changes? And, and Brian, you've obviously got a very much kind of an outsider perspective. I'd love to kind of hear from you first. Yeah, I think especially in today's day and age, and especially in the virtual environment, there are infinite sources for learning about new things. Um, and it can be overwhelming at times. And so for me, and in particular, you know, I'm focused on the consumer side on audience growth. And so I pick and choose my sources of inspiration for where I learn, and I actually look outside the industry for these things. And we talked earlier about how bringing in that outside perspective into it can be helpful. We talked about how member experience is really important to us. And so when it comes to improving my skills and my team skills, um, I'm not looking in market research, I'm looking at the best consumer apps and the best consumer websites out there. Um, so for me, for example, I'm into fitness and I look at apps like Strava and Peloton, they do a great job with consumer engagement and gamification. And so for me, I think, you know, as I think about skill sets that, that folks should adapt, it's it's being able to learn quickly, um, but it's also being able to pick and choose where you want to learn from. And for me, I've kind of found a niche on, on the consumer app and the consumer game side um, to be able to kind of bring that learning into the market research industry. Yeah, it's such a key point. And I think it's something that I hadn't really thought about it until I, until I joined Susie. And I, I remember speaking to our CEO, Matt, and and mentioning, you know, this is what some of the other agile platforms are doing and thinking. And he said, I'm not thinking about those guys. I'm thinking about Shopify. What is Shopify doing? And what is Peloton doing? And what are those other companies doing that are outside of our industry? Because typically disruption always comes from the outside. Um, I very much enjoy a podcast called How I Built This. And it's usually people like the founders of Jira, the founders of Expedia, talking about how they built their business. And I now try and deliberately listen to a lot of market research podcasts, obviously, but I try and hone my skills on just general kind of like business growth and, and so on as well. Um, personally, for me, you know, as the, the industry has changed so much over the past 20 years, I remember probably 2011, 2012, starting to hear about kind of APIs, programmatic sampling needs. And I quickly thought to myself, I'm going to be out of date with my own career if I don't keep up to speed with what's happening. So my, I always kind of challenge everybody with, you know, seek out the people in your R&D team, seek out the engineers at your company, seek out the data scientists um, and make sure that you continue to stay educated um, on what 
their perception is on the future of our industry um, as well. And I love spending time with our chief product officer, Nick, um, and our other product developers to really understand the ins and outs of how they're building the technology, um, try and dive deeper with people like Mary and our center of excellence team to really understand those complex research methodologies, the old and the new and how they should be adapted for the future. And, you know, really stay curious is, is definitely one of those, uh, one of those mantras I try to stick to. Um, Mary, what about you? What advice do you have for market researchers who are trying to kind of future-proof their roles? Well, I also took it from more of a uh, personality, you know, how, think about how you approach things uh, perspective. I totally agree with the curiosity, be curious, you know, and I laugh because I think sometimes I drive people around me crazy with my curiosity. <laughs> A little bit, but you know what? I think it, ex it inspires great research, right? And um, if you, you know, if you're not curious and and wondering why and how, and you know, I I, I just really think it's critical um, to standing out in your career. Um, also, follow your gut. You know, if results don't make sense, um, find out what's driving it. You know, you know, peek under the hood. Do what you have to do. Uh, come at it from all sides, but just, you know, really draw in it because clients will appreciate it. If it takes longer, you know, keep them updated. But, you know, even if it takes longer, getting them the right answer is much more valuable. You know, so I would I would say that you'll stand out, uh, get used to change and embrace it for sure. Um, and stay ahead of the tech curve whenever possible. And, and sometimes that, you know, uh, means reaching out to people in that area and understanding, as Katie mentioned, um, what's what's happening, what's on what's on tap, um, what's coming down the pike. Um, use it and share it, um, you know, get your feet dirty, uh, you know, your hands and feet dirty and uh, provide feedback uh, to drive positive change. Um, I would say that is one of the most humbling and satisfac satisfying experiences for me is when I can provide feedback and, you know, just like our panel members, you know, see a difference, you know, see that you've made a difference, see improvements and know that you had a, a, a say in that. Um, so all of those things, I think, you know, ladder up to um, being uh, considered a standout in your position and really being successful. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the, uh, you know, that driving that curiosity of always like, why, why, why push it? Why, why? And I remember when Brian and I first started working together a year ago, I'd often be kind of rattling off various things in the sample industry. And, <laughs> and Brian, you said that to me, why, why is it done that way? Why does that matter? Why does it have to be that way? I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't looked back and thought about it for a while. You're right. We should think about why, why were we doing it the way we were doing it 20 years ago? And I love that curiosity. Absolutely. Um, Brian, I know that obviously at Susie, we we live by the mantra enabling um, human understanding. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about you know what your thoughts are on how market researchers can adapt? Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes in market research, and kind of to your point, we can forget what we're trying to do here, right? We talk about LOIs or CPIs or filling that survey or quotas or whatever it is, and in reality. I think it's important for us to take a step back, think about the first principles, and we're trying to learn from people and create better products, better messaging, and anything like that. And so yes, we live by the mantra, enable human understanding when we build our company and our people, but that's also a Suzy value because it's so important to everything that we do. And so I think when you're thinking about kind of, you know, future-proofing the roles, um, going back to the beginning and saying like, what are we really trying to do here? And I think enabling human understanding is a really good way of putting that because I think, you know, if that's what we think about our jobs here and you know, us three here have different roles and different backgrounds, but we're all kind of marching towards the same beat. That's I think how we can create the products and the ads and the experiences of the future. Yeah. I love that kind of Facebook meme that's going around recently that says, you know, say in the most basic words, what you do for a living every day. And I always just say, I just like asking people what they like <laughs> so it's the, the, in this most basic format. Um, for those who are, who are listening to us today and are just starting out their careers in market research, what do you think is the most critical thing for them to know about this particular era of change? Um, and Brian, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, so first off, research is fun. I remember when we were talking about doing this pivot and research wasn't my background and I was like, market research? I don't know about that, right? <laughs> but now that I've been through it for a few years at this point, um, you get to have this massive impact on new products that get created, new things you see out in the world. And so 
if you're considering whether or not you want to be here, um, then you should. I didn't start in this industry, nor did I even pick it, frankly, uh, but I'm so glad I did. I think second, and kind of going back to the point of curiosity also, is to make sure that you don't think that your idea of how it should be done is wrong just because it's not currently done like that. Um, there's so many people outside the industry that we need to come in and tell us how it should be done. And then we can partner with people like you, Katie, people like you, Mary, to figure out how we can drive home same, the same or even better results in a faster and better and more cost-efficient way and ultimately build the future of research together. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, it's crystal ball time. So let's think of the crystal ball for a minute. Where do you see the industry going in the next year or the next five years? And Mary, we'll start with you. I feel like um, we are, again, we are just um, going full throttle. Um, we online, I think, will become much more prevalent. You know, doing less with more will become prevalent, uh, even more prevalent. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a wait and see, depending upon you know this you know next year and what happens with the pandemic and and how we um, you know continually pivot based on that. Um, but I think it really is about change and about being flexible. Yeah. Adaptability and flexibility, definitely, definitely key to evolution and career evolution, for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mary and Brian. I feel like I've learned so much from both of you today that <laughs> I, I didn't know from before. Um, thank you for everyone that attended our session today. I really hope that you enjoyed our conversation. I look forward to seeing you all hopefully at a face-to-face -face, um, event soon, or if they pivot to virtual, then I'll absolutely see you at some of the uh, industry virtual events coming up soon and would love to chat. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.